My brother is only 16 months younger than I am. We grew up really close in age. And my dad was an only child. And so when we would fight, he would be so confused and sad. He would say, well, why do you guys fight? Why, why can't you get along? Why are you fighting? And I remember being a kid and hearing him say that and say, well, what else is there to do? <laughs> we want to fight. We're, we're, we're annoyed with each other. And my dad didn't understand it. But we hear in the gospel that Jesus understood it. He knew human nature. He knew why kids fight. He knew why if a kid decides to play with a toy that you own, but you haven't looked at for three months or five months, you'll go and take that and make that kid cry. Jesus understood human nature. The thing that makes brothers fight and makes a lot of us do things that we later regret is that human beings, to a person, are pretty much addicted to doing what we want right now. I want to do this, and I want to do it now. I want that, and I want it now. We, we can't go a day without having those thoughts and feelings. That's just part of our nature. If you dangle something in front of us, we're going to swipe at it. And if someone else swipes at it first, we're going to want to fight them for it. And that's why God said, Moses, they need, they need guidelines. Give them these commandments. The commandments are not really rules. If you read through them, they don't sound like rules. They're much more like operating instructions from the manufacturer. Like if you want the blender to work, you've got to do this, this, and this with it. If you, if you don't do that, it, it won't work. The blade can't go on top of the guard. You've got to put the blade first in and then the guard. And that's exactly what the operating instructions are like from the Ten Commandments. They fall into three categories if you look over them. The first one is keep focused on God. The first three commandments are actually just like don't lose your focus on God. Don't get distracted by things that aren't God. Anything you're doing, make God the center of it. The second category is like don't do things without pausing first. Don't think that the first instinct you have is the right one. Pause. If you don't pause before you act, you're likely to regret it. Don't be quick if you're hurt or angry or worried to, to do the first thing that comes to mind. And then the third category is all about not trusting our thoughts necessarily. Don't, don't trust all your thoughts, those commandments say. You, you could be wrong. Don't think your opinions or your thoughts are commandments. They're not. These are the commandments. Those are just information. So those are the three categories. They're really operating instructions. They're not rules. They're, they're guidelines from the manufacturer for what will help us. And, and you and I know that when human beings, ourselves included, stray from those guidelines, we fall apart. Things stop working. Things aren't harmonious anymore. So Lent is all about looking at these commandments in our lives and seeing where there is work to be done. We are using Lent as a way to prepare ourselves to get ready for heaven. We're getting ready. Someday we're going to move into a much nicer neighborhood than this. And we have to get ready. We have to decide what we're going to do with that old junky trampoline we keep. Because it's not going to fit in the new neighborhood. It doesn't belong there. What are the things that we need to work on? And, and the thing about Lent is a lot of us approach it as if it's like a training session. Like we need to hire a trainer and, and do a bunch of stuff to be really aggressive about building ourselves up. But Lent is not so much about building up or adding on. It's about taking away. 
Most of Lent is about letting go of what doesn't belong. You may have heard the story about Michelangelo carving the statue David. Probably all of us have seen an image of David. Some of us are lucky enough to have actually gone to the museum in Florence where he is. It's unbelievable. He, it's a human being carved out of a piece of granite 17 feet tall. And he's so lifelike, when you see the tendons in the back of his hand, you almost expect to see a pulse. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And it was like that from the first day it was unveiled. People couldn't believe it. And so somebody said to Michelangelo at the unveiling, how in the world did you create David out of solid rock? How did you do that? And he said, I didn't create David. I just chiseled away everything that wasn't David. And there he was. I didn't create him. I chiseled away what didn't belong. And when all the things that didn't belong were chiseled away, he was clearly there. That's Lent. That's what Lent is. Lent is the chiseling away of everything that is not going to fit in heaven. Everything that's not going to go through the front door doesn't belong there. So like there's some very clear examples of this. Our, our list of grudges, the people that we hold on to grudges about, can't bring that to heaven. There's no grudges in heaven. We clearly can tell that, right? We got to let go of that before we go. What are we going to be pouting in the corner of heaven, mad about something that happened at work 40 years? Can't go. How about our hurts and our wounds, our, our childhood struggles? Our, that doesn't belong in heaven. How about worrying? What do people worry about in heaven? Somebody who makes a habit or a career out of worrying? What are you going to do in heaven? How are you going to go cold turkey on the day you die to just stop worrying when it's been your whole life? Do you see? Those are the things. Because all of those all of those problems, worrying and, and grudges and, and melancholy, none of that belongs there. One poet says, if you ever cried in heaven, everyone would start laughing because they would know you were joking. There's no reason. So the difficulty of Lent is realizing how much we cling to those things that aren't going to fit through the front door of heaven. The more we cling, the harder it is to let go of it and the less prepared we realize we are for what comes next. And we start to realize, I've got work to do. That's what Lent really feels like. I got work to do to get ready. I thought I was ready, but if I got hit by a bus today, there's all this stuff that I'm carrying around that can't get into heaven. And it's going to be really hard to chisel it off. I have to start now. How else is it going to come off? So the real challenge is when we've adopted some things that we actually start to think are part of us instead of something we have to let go of. Like, for example, when someone says, well, sweetheart, of course I worry about you. That's because I love you. Worry is how I show love. Not in heaven. We're going to have to figure out how to do that differently. You don't show love in heaven by worrying about people. There's nothing to worry about. How about when someone says, yeah, I get mad. I spout off. But like, it's just because I care, right? I mean, I say it like it is. I'm that kind of per Not in heaven. I apologize later. Not in heaven. All of that, that's part of here. We got to chisel that away. That doesn't belong here. Or in heaven, rather. How about this one? Hard one. People who say, I'm extremely sensitive. My extreme sensitivity is at the heart of who I am. Not in heaven. There's no one wounded in heaven or, or melancholy in heaven. So all of those things that we think are parts of ourselves that are inextricable from who we are, we got to figure out how to create distance from that. It's almost like when you go to the hygienist, the dental hygienist, and our smile has gotten dingy. 
because it's covered with plaque and tartar. And they get it all off. And it feels so much better. That's what we're, we're working on. And one of the reasons why it's so important to come here every week is because there is one experience we get to have that is the perfect example of what it would feel like to have everything that doesn't belong chiseled away. And it's the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, everything that isn't Christ has been chiseled away. Anything that's bread is chiseled away and all that's left is Christ. Anything that was wine has been chiseled away. The only thing that's left is his body and his blood. It's got him and nothing else. What a feeling that is. And then when we receive the Eucharist, we're feeding the David inside of us. We're feeding the part of us that belongs, that's eternal. It doesn't give any nourishment to the parts that need to get chiseled away. It doesn't, it doesn't send fuel to that bunion. It starves it. It goes instead only to David. So that's one of the things that we're being invited to, to do on Tuesday. That day of reconciliation is a chance to chisel, to start naming those things. We, we kind of, on Tuesday, order the truck that's going to haul all the stuff we chisel off to the junkyard. So we got the truck, and now we're like, what are we going to put in there? And we, we say, maybe my anger, maybe my sense of superiority, maybe it's not telling the truth, or give, giving into vanity, thinking that the outside matters. Maybe it's jealousy. What, what role does jealousy have in heaven? Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's fear and worry. Maybe it's overconsumption or selfishness. Things that have no place in glory. And then we chisel it and we load up the truck and we ask God to haul it away. That's what Lent's all about. It's about getting ready. Because let's face it, if we showed up in heaven and we're angry or crying or worried, everyone would just laugh. Because they would know we were only kidding. 